Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the diff on this penultimate day of the festival. We're live in Cows from the studio, and today we're going to be talking about circular economy, Europe, and China. Uh, with me in the studio is my good colleague, Jay Zhou, who's a senior program officer at the foundation, very involved in the China initiative and all the work that we do. And online, live from London, is Professor Bleischwitz, who's the head of department of the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources at University College London. So thank you very much both. Thanks Let's dive me. into the, uh, the conversation. And uh, Raymond, I understand you're coming back from uh, China. Literally, you were there a few days ago as part yeah. of a, uh, a study tour or a uh, visit to your partner university in Shanghai as you're developing common projects around circular economy, which is really interesting. But maybe before we dive into that, could you give us your first impressions of how the country is evolving? What's the latest trends that you see emerging? Uh, thanks, Josh, and hello to everyone. Um, yes, I've been returning from a trip to Shanghai this Monday morning, actually, and it is <laughs> always exciting to be in China. So this time in Shanghai, we had the meeting with our partner university, which is the Shanghai Jiao Tong University. We visited the first time this time the what they call the low carbon college, which is located in Lingang, which is going to be one of the most exciting areas. In fact, a small town of uh, 500,000 or so inhabitants, including the college, fully equipped with low carbon technology, circular economy type of buildings, etc. And they're aiming high here. They're also supported by the Lingang uh, provincial government with all sorts of support for funding, but also for ambitious plans. So one of our ideas is besides continuing our collaboration and research would also be to uh, collaborate on the teaching side. So we consider a dual master program for both Chinese students and for other students from around the world on the topic of a circular economy as the objective that we both have for the next two or three years and set it up and run it. But what I also find in China itself, when you walk through Shanghai, for instance, is this enormous speed of development. And I'm sure G can say more about it in a minute. I was this time most impressed by not seeing a credit cards or contactless payment with car any longer, but instead a mobile phone. So in a way they are avoiding plastic waste, uh, but essentially it also means that you as a tourist either need to have an app or pay in cash or find other means. So the sort of digitalization on their side is, I would say, a little more advanced than it is here in London or probably in other parts of, of, of uh, Europe or the world. On the other hand, you also still, uh, still see the waste pickers around on their bikes and carrying vast amounts of uh, steel and whatever they can find. So this sort of uh, mixed impressions probably uh, confirm what we also have figured out in our research project, which we've had with the, Zhao Tong, uh, Zhao, uh, with the Shanghai Zhao Tong University with Geng Yong over the last three to four years a collaboration between five partners from four countries, where I would say the main take-home message is that China is impressive and successful when it comes to circular economy as being promoted through industrial parks, which are all large-scale. So roughly one-third of the manufacturing takes place in those industrial parks. And this is... Um, not in any comparison to anything we have here in Europe, and many of them move uh, with full sales forward to a circular economy. Then they also have an impressive uh, detail for indicators, how you measure progress, what indicators are in, how they measure it across provinces, um, China in total, but also the industrial parks, not without inconsistencies indeed, but with an level of detail where my feeling is that in Europe be right now do not yet have the indicators to the degree that they have it in China. And indeed also many of the technology developments are just impressive like the uh, progress in electric vehicles being on the road. Scooters wow. actually are a very dominant um, vehicle you see on the streets in cities like Shanghai. On the other hand, 
um, there are some things which are a bit surprising to see, say, less included in the circular economy efforts. The cement production is still uh, gigantic, five times as high per capita as it is in any other industrialized country. And then indeed with cement come like lots of pollution uh, in urban areas because the cement is produced more or less on the side. Uh, we have uh, maybe a need to discuss more about the construction minerals in the circular uh, economy package. We will also probably look at future risk of the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is one of the main foreign policy uh, tools of the Chinese government stretching into Europe, actually, through Central Asia, but also into the South Pacific, where right now, in ongoing research efforts, we have the indication is that this leads to higher pollution, uh, to keeping what they call the zombie industries alive, these energy intensive companies that operate, say, below any uh, efficiency standard. And from that perspective, looking forward to those initiatives and gives them a bit more of a green flavor definitely is something that we would have to consider in the time of our discussion here. So after all, I am quite impressed, but also with some mixed feeling uh, about the overall performance and things sometimes being a bit behind and not yet included to the degree they might. Yeah. I may stop here. Jay. Having grown up in China, how do you relate to that? How do you see the, uh, the evolution of the Chinese society over the past, let's say, 30 years? Yeah, and um, thanks a lot, George, for the question. So I think um, it's different from Shanghai, because Ruben talked her, his perspective about Shanghai, which is the top-ranked city in China. Actually, I was born and grew up in a tier two, like a second tier city, which is... Unpack that for our listeners, tier two. So basically in China, we have like metropolitans like mm. Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, which have more than 20 uh, million population. Well, my hometown is slightly smaller, about 10 to 15 million population. Um, but those kind of cities are experiencing a high economic growth. So uh, from my perspective, I've witnessed the great change of my hometown. Like for example, first of all, the built environment the house where I grew up and where I was born is already gone. And the replace of that is, you know, a massive area of high rise building blocks. And it is still coming more and more. So that is the sign of the urbanization in China. And it's still coming along all the time. And linked back to what Raymond just said, the cement production in China is it's just massively huge. Uh, that is all you know, because of the urbanization. And another thing uh, which I experienced is the transport. So especially the last mile transport. So we used to have, you know, a bike or tube public transport, but not for the last miles. Last miles has been an issue in China, but now we can have sharing bikes, which has become quite popular in China. So the sharing bikes give access to everyone and at a very cheap and affordable price for people to travel around, like within five kilometers. Um, and uh, another thing which I like to mention is about the lifestyle. So giving more and more p Chinese people are getting into the middle class and there is a lot of change in their lifestyle. For example, people dining out a lot more than they used to do. Another thing is about the booming of the gig economy. So as Raymond mentioned, nowadays no one carry, carries cash around. Everything can basically like solved in your phone. Uh, if I want to get my food delivered, there is an app on my phone to get my lunch, get my Starbucks coffees, basically get pay for everything. On, on, it's just only a map. So that has completely changed people's lifestyle as well. And I uh, um, have to mention sharing economy is booming in China as well. So, for example, because um, Chinese consumers, they are quite adaptive into the new concept. So there is a new um, platform called White Closet, which is sharing clothes. So instead of buying like high-end or mid-end clothes, I can rent one. And which allows me like a cheap access to a good quality clothes over there. So um, that is pretty much my, like, what I experienced. 
After so a lot of change really quickly, yeah. uh, but that has a lot of material impact as well because if everything's done on phone, then the digital revolution for sure, enabling more, let's say, virtualization mm -hmm. and displacement of the need for physical assets. But digitization does involve a lot of hardware as well, and electronic waste is a massive issue in China. Mm -hmm. uh, Raymond, do you know any specific policies that the government might have put in place in order to circularize that sector a bit and, and deal with that waste? Uh, well, yes, actually they do. Uh, one issue I wanted to mention is that indeed online delivery also comes with plastic waste massively yeah. and they really wrap up lots of plastic around whatever is delivered. But on the sourcing of materials, um, China is known in some circles for their rare earths uh, rare earth elements policy and what they have done in fact over the last years is that they have declared parts of the domestic rare earth industry as illegal which is interesting because they have been faced with a sort of an overcapacity they also saw the way the permissions were being done within China would give too much permission to the provinces and then I wanted to centralize it a bit but at the same time was like having a stronger overall steer on the mining and the first stages of the supply chain of those uh, materials within China. They have organized stronger incentives for the other parts of the supply chain to be located in China. So I see lots of change in China happening. This relates to both the mining but also the involvement of China in Africa. China was, I would say, correctly criticized five years ago or in the last years for not really being willing to establish due diligence in the supply chain. And this has changed more recently in more companies feeling the pressure from the international community but producing in China, um, being pushing forward on the due diligence of sourcing agenda. And that, in effect, would also lead to better efforts to organize recycling efforts. So I would think, after all, China, uh, China is much more open to sustainable sourcing. And indeed, they realize that with the consumption society moving on, there is also business to make on the uh, end of the life part of the story. And th from that perspective, moving forward on the recycling, the recovery that is on the Chinese agenda. Jay, you mentioned the, uh, the rise of uh, that new middle class and uh, the uh, negative impact of their consumption. Mm -hmm. So we've worked on a, on a big report on the potential for a circular economy of, in China, and you've been a, a really important part of this. Can you talk us through a couple of the insights that come out of that report, which incidentally we launched at the World Economic Forum meeting of champions in uh, Tianjin, a small yeah. city of 15 million people? <laughs> Yep, I'm happy to do that. So um, as we all know, China has been a pioneer of circular economy uh, policies and the practices as well. So, um, and the China's cities has been the hub of circular innovation for a long time as well. So that's why we, in our report, we really focus into urban China area. And then we looked into five different sectors, which first a built environment, mobility, um, food area, but that is in urban area. And another two industrial sectors, which are textile and electronics. Because if you go to see like everything's made in China, especially for electronics and, and clothes. Um, so, so after that research, it is a research we've done with McKinsey together. We have lots of modeling insight, we collect the data. And there, there, there are three key insights we find out from the report. So uh, we found out a transition to a circular economy in Chinese cities could, first of all, uh, make goods and service more affordable for citizens. Because we were talking about the business model of access over ownership. Instead of owning everything, buying a new car, a second car, and then we can get the service. Because end of the day, what we need for a car is transport me from A to B. That is what we need for the service. And then secondly, um, at the same time, we have like we can enjoy the middle class 
lifestyle as the cheaper, co cheaper cost, but at the same time, we could reduce the environmental impact by enjoying the high quality middle class lifestyle. So, and also make the city more livable. So I can give you some um, like results from our research. Um, so by 2040, the um, emissions of fine particular matters could be reduced by 15 percentage. So that's, we're talking air pollution and microparticles that are detrimental to exactly. people's breathing yeah. apparatus. Exactly. So that hugely improved the air quality, especially in bigger cities, giving the background of urbanization and more and more construction still happening every day. And secondly, the greenhouse gas emission could be reduced by 23 percentage. This is because of the shared mobility, because now in China, most of the mobility, they are still using petrol. Um, so that generates lots of greenhouse gas emission. And also there is a shift from fossil fuel to renewable energies that will help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well. And lastly, it will um, help to reduce traffic congestion by 47 percentage. So those are the results from our report. So we can see um, all the positive impacts from the circular economy transition. Raymond, any reflections on, uh, on those figures? And I'd like to disclose at this stage that uh, Jay has been a student of yours. So how would you say she's doing right now? I'm certainly quite proud of uh, seeing G around and doing such an excellent job. And indeed, I would also say she really has grown up quite a lot. So I'll give you all the honors for this. Uh, on the side of modeling, um, we have come up with a slightly different approach with yet slightly similar data. So one of the things we have been doing in our research project is that we looked at the per capita consumption of materials over time in four industrialized countries, but also in China for the last 100 years. And that's an interesting exercise because you could realize when the peak of using and consuming materials is actually to be reached, depending on, say, historic experience when you look at UK, but also countries like US, Japan and Germany. And we figured out when it comes to the consumption of uh, steel in particular that China is now at this peak. Uh, with regard to cement, as we said, it's really exceeding any sort of historical experience. And with regard to copper consumption, it's already uh, also more or less at the peak of uh, what we have been witnessing in other countries. The implication of which is that we would not necessarily expect the Chinese economy to continue growing in the demand for those natural resources for the next years and decades. And this then has implications for what is typically called the business as usual scenario, where many traditional analysts still believe China can be expected to, say, double the demand in natural resources in the next 20 or 30 years. And we would say no, just following from this historical observation, we would not expect this development to happen. If we then put on top of this the efforts toward a circular economy, actually the opportunities are really, really huge that we can tap into with like more secondary steel coming on stream and being able to be used. And so we did this sort of exercise that G mentioned with a newly established macroeconomic model, CGE type, general equilibrium. Uh, and then indeed have put so much data in it. And it was such an incredible amount of work. But from that perspective, we are now more certain to say that this potential shift from an economy demanding more and more primary resources to an economy that uses more secondary resources has positive macroeconomic implications for China and possibly also for other parts of the world. So that's pretty good. The numbers which you've mentioned, G, I find them quite impressive uh, with regard to CO2 emissions, also with the pollutants. Uh, we are less certain when it comes to those data because you always have like winners and losers and a range of uncertainties, like how does the One Belt, One Road initiative plays out. So we are a bit more cautious to come up with uh, like 20 
3% down in CO2 emissions, but I very much appreciate uh, you doing this job. Uh, we instead say, well, we would expect some positive impacts and have done some more detailed studies uh, which are yet to be published on the steel side. And the government really has a strong push on the, uh, on the what they call the ecological society. Ecological civilization. Yes. Civilization, sorry, yes. yes. Uh, and as China is very much top-down when it comes to policy right. and the strategic um, determination of what the uh, future of growth looks yeah. like, I mean, we've seen the government deliberately curb their level of growth as well, sometimes with the, uh, the narrative that it was deliberately in order to limit the, the excesses of material consumption and, and pollution. But is that something that you can foresee carrying on if it really becomes at the expense of the country's uh, development index in the way they see it? Or is it something that they're really balancing very finely? Or do you really think that the uh, ecological civilization is an overarching goal that they will pursue whatever happens? Mm. I think from my perspective, like the ecological civilization is like a big umbrella. So a lot of things is under that umbrella. That is, as just you mentioned, is an overarching goal. We want to achieve that stage. And then under the umbrella, there are three main pillars. So the first pillar is related to material consumption and resource efficiency, which the Chinese government defined it as circular economy. So the whole circular economy is dedicated to how to increase the resource consumption, how to, uh, we have three R principles, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. So how could we do that, given the background of industrialization still happening in China? And the second pillar is low carbon economy. That is more related to energy consumption, because how to shift from the fossil fuel to renewables, and that is called low carbon um, economy, which is like decarbonize the GDP growth from the fossil fuel energy consumption. So that's why in some cities, for example, Shenzhen, which is uh, uh, it's also a metropolitan big city next to Hong Kong, um, the whole city have been, has been adopting the electrical vehicles for the taxi, public transport. And they have been, they've been doing a brilliant job over there. Um, and then last pillar is green economy. So the green economy is more associated with industrial parks because the, the GDP increase in China, like set more than 17 percentage, actually is contributed from industrial parks. So how could we make the industrial parks greener? So that is that pillar dedicated to. And then um, with the support from the three pillars, finally we want to, the government want to achieve their ecological civilization. Great, thanks for that. I'd like to, explore the uh, implications of European and Chinese discussions at the moment, specifically for circular economy. But before we go into that, there is an interesting comment uh, that came through. And it's Russell who is asking, why do we talk of China with this air of mystique, almost like it's another planet? Are we in Europe generally ignorant of what's going on over there? I think it's fair to say that even if we have a better and better idea, there are still a lot of people who don't see what's happening, don't understand. And what we're trying to do here is to make ourselves less ignorant about it. There are cultural differences. So maybe, uh, maybe we are too mystique when we talk about it, but there are big questions and it's, it's worth debunking them. And I hope, Russell, that you agree at the end of the session that you will have learned something, unless, of course, you're an expert on the topic, in which case, bear with us. But let's look at what's coming up next uh, in the diff. Good afternoon, everyone. So, coming up at 8 p.m. GMT tonight, we have our final headline act of DIFF 2018. It's the engaging Areti Marco Pulo leading the Advanced Architecture Group, and they'll be exploring how design and science can positively impact and transform the present and future of our built spaces and the way we live and interact. Coming up tomorrow at 1 p.m. GMT, we're joined by Radhika Bynan from the Young Foundation and Benedict Delop from RSA. Pitch your questions to them live as we explore ideas around social innovation, participation and the impact of emerging technology on the world of work. Finally, for something completely different, the DIFF team and Ella MacArthur herself will be here tomorrow at 5pm GMT for an excellent roundup of the best bits of the DIFF. 
don't miss it because the edited version will no doubt be stripped of the most hilarious and awkward bits. Back to you, Mr. Blario. Monsieur Blario. Monsieur Blario. Very good, thank you guys. Uh, you're almost there. Uh, for those of you just joining us, I'm here in the studio with my colleague Jay, who's part of the uh, China team at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Senior Program Officer, and live from London, Professor Bleichwitz uh, at uh, University College London, an expert in economic uh, resource management and economic uh, forecasting as well when it comes to resource consumption and use. So we're just talking about the... the um, the very recent MOU that was signed by the European Commission and the Chinese Authority specifically on uh, circular economy. So that was in July and yes the text is very embryonic but it does touch upon a few interesting bits one of which is the uh, extended producer responsibility and some design measures. So whereas circular economy in Chinese policy might have been seen as very three R's oriented and very recycling oriented. It seems like there's a, there's a move upstream towards more design and uh, looking at phasing pollution out from the outset. Uh, let's project a bit and imagine that this MOU gives rise to maybe product standards between the two markets. Mm -hmm. If Europe and China agree on those standards, then basically they're sh tipping the whole global economy towards circularity because who in their right mind would produce anything that doesn't go either on the Chinese market or on the European market. Are we allowed to, uh, to dream a bit here, Raymond? What do you think? Well, as an academic, don't ask me whether we are allowed to dream, <laughs> but we can forecast with some evidence of what we would expect to happen and based on the sort of niches we see in innovation, we are certainly also encouraged to say what we would expect to uh, uh, see these niches emerging and standards are to me one of the key items where I would expect both policymakers being interested in, but in particular also business. They predominantly produce in China and sell in Europe. And with a consumption society growing in China, we would expect also more consumption to happen in China. And indeed, with the European reindustrialization strategy, we would expect more manufacturing and larger parts of the supply chain eventually happening here. So there is a common interest in having at least comparable standards and eventually a joint standard formulation for, I would say, key products like vehicles, but also on the construction side, because actually some of the components are being produced in a similar manner. So having like uh, standards on food, on mobility, on construction would be one of the breakthroughs. And Jay, with your interactions with uh, Chinese officials and public bodies as part of the work that we've done at the foundation, do you foresee that there is a really strong interest in aligning those objectives with stakeholders outside of China or, or do you think it's still very much let's implement it at home and then see if it fits with the rest of the world? What's the approach? Um, well, just based on some conversation I have with our stakeholders in China, officials and also academia and the business leaders. So um, China really see um, both China and Europe are the two biggest powerhouse in terms of the circular economy transition. And those two um, biggest powerhouse is should, should collaborate with each other, not compete with each other. So that is why we have this circular economy MOU. And uh, the circular economy MOU is not only about uh, um, talking, it's not, it, it is a high level dialogue, but what, what the two bodies want to do is to bring it from um, theory into more practice stage. So for example, plastic is one of the focus area and the plastic would be the first topic, both sides to pick it up and then to implement and scale it up. Um, but we all know like end of beginning of this year, um, basically Chinese government closed the door for the other waste um, from Europe and from the American. So that's, that's plastic ban or that's waste ban include 24 different styles of the waste. Um, so it's, it's, it's happened a little bit abrupt. It make a little bit um, chaos in China as well because 
Before that ban, those wastes used to be feedstock for some business in China. But at this stage, there is no secondary resource for the business in China, especially for small and medium business in China. And they need to um, spend more time, so sorry, spend more cost to find you know, the raw material. So it's become a um, kind of like a, a barrier in front of them. And at the same time, um, I would argue it is for sure it is something right to do, but I would argue um, whether it is the right way to do things, just to say we're going to face out, we're going to have this ban, um, and that's going to happen immediately. But I think the government needs to uh, plan it out with Europe, with Europe together. So how we face out um, those plastics slowly through the whole value chain, rather than just to like snap, get it done quickly. Yes, but at the same time, you hear in those discussions in, uh, in Europe and, and in other countries, a lot of NGOs are really pushing for that type of immediate ban, arguing that uh, incremental measures don't get us anywhere. And it's, it's, it could be argued in that way as well. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that I didn't think that the government would have done it if they thought there was a detrimental effect on, on business, even domestically, which seems to be the case. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. if you look from the other side, the uh, Eurostat figures are pretty clear. Mm -hmm. In less than a year, we went from exporting 165 kilotons of plastic waste a month to just 12, which means that all of that stuff either sits in EU countries or, and that's a bit worrying, they get shipped to countries which have even less of an infrastructure to deal with it. The fact is that it is a wake-up call as well for those countries putting that plastic on the market mm -hmm. because there was an outlet for it and shove it away, it gets recycled or not, but anyway, it's not here. Mm -hmm. And I was recently talking to uh, an American representative uh, as part of some World Trade Organization mm -hmm. discussions who said that's a really important signal that was sent because in the US it does accumulate. They don't send it anywhere else, apparently, less so than the Europeans. So it's visible and it's there, and that's an incentive for mm -hmm. people who put stuff on the market to do it differently, or for legislator, if they have an appetite for this, to prescribe a bit more. I mean, Raymond, how, how do you... I'd like to, you to react on that, uh, on that ban thing, and do you have a strong view whether it should be more gradual or whether a hard hammer approach is, is effective? Hard hammer. I mean, this is the disruptive innovation festival, right? And I saw it actually this shock wave that was sent through the entire world uh, through this ban on plastic waste import was actually healthy. And I don't see any strong harm on any economy right now myself. Uh, rather, the, all the pledges that the companies have come up with, like the Coca-Colas and all the others, to now say, we want to go 100% recycling over the next few years. I think it was really stimulated through this disruptive measure by one strong country. And in that regard, I thought uh, disruptive, yes, but also quite a strong nudge towards innovating. And uh, they could have done it more elegantly one way or another. But I would really think it has been a good process. And also when I look at how, say, innovation typically works, uh, sometimes it goes more the incremental way, but sometimes the, the disruptive way is also what just happens. When we look within Europe, we've had unexploited opportunities of recycling, of plastic recycling within Europe. So we would now expect more recycling happening within Europe, across countries, across member states. Uh, in that the capacities in Scandinavian countries or a few others have been there, but they could not compete with the price or with the cost of exporting the plastic waste to China. So uh, ironically, or you could say almost cynically, the price for organizing the uh, secondary chain in Europe was more expensive than exporting all the stuff to China. So something is wrong in the markets here. And we would expect that the Europeans will quickly pick up the opportunities and reorganize their secondary markets for plastic within the European Union. And hopefully not what uh, you just have indicated. 
But besides, there are also all these efforts from companies now to reorganize the production, come up with new materials. I'm actually having like a plastic bag here saying that this is a recyclable plastic. So there are all sorts of experiments where small and larger producers come up with new innovative materials, with uh, new business models. And this all has been triggered, inter alia indeed, uh, by this Chinese export uh, import ban on plastics. Uh, so I would say, yes, a lot is happening. And I would indeed, given the scale of the problem, also hope that these innovations then really fly and uh, trickle down into larger parts of the world. When it comes to China, they certainly also have lots of domestic issues to solve, mm -hmm. like so much of the pollutants going into the rivers and from the rivers into the sea. So what I've seen, for instance, there's a startup here in London, I'm sure there are others too, that now do a large-scale experiment, a demonstration in China of trying to collect the plastic within the river and then collect it and use it as a new feedstock for the industries within China. They, are, oh, they have been patenting it. It's a group of well former students, so it's quite a young startup. And those are the sort of innovations that indeed we would like to see more often happening. And you mentioned the, the domestic uh, issues and societal problems that the government has to deal with. That, mm -hmm. There's a question from Marco here who asks if we can assume there is no citizen pressure on the government to act towards a low-carbon economy. Is there, is there pressure from the citizens? In okay. China or here? In or China, in sorts? China, yes. Uh, I would say absolutely yes. The people started to get angry, in particular about the air pollution, and I'm sure G can confirm. The question probably is, what does it mean in a society and in a political system like China when the people get angry? My understanding is that the voices of the people are being heard. There's so much more transparency on what the actual state of the air pollution is. People are queuing to get like a license plate for clean air type of, uh, for cleaner vehicles. So in that sense, I would think that the ways of how the civil society is organizing itself certainly differs. There's less of a voice, I would say, for NGOs in China, but also a strong influence of the citizens themselves. So I have difficulties to make an outlook, but compared to the situation five or ten years ago, my impression is that the voice of the civil society has become stronger in China. Jay, would you agree with that? Yeah. And, and if that's the case, how does that voice uh, organize itself? How, are there any collectives of citizens? Is it... It's not necessarily NGOs, is it local level? What is it? I um, definitely agree with what Raymond just said. I think there are lots of like a localized NGO um, starting getting involved into these environmental issues from air pollution to waste to pollution just near the seaside. Um, it's kind of like a self-organized, but sometimes they're also struggling with um, getting their voice to be heard by the central government. Mm -hmm. Because we talked about earlier, the policy in China is really top down. So um, if their voices cannot be heard by their top layer, how could the policy be implemented and then trickle down to business? Um, but um, at, at the same time of this top down policy, we can also say bottom up. I, I think these are two things happening in China at the same time. So at some business, they already have some bottom-up um, business innovation. For example, we've been talking about food delivery a lot. And we knew, like I have a data with me. Um, the first half of this year, China's three biggest online food delivery platforms, um, they made 34 million uh, deliveries on the average single day. So every day they have 34 millions of packaging produced as well. So one of the um, biggest food delivery, because we as Chinese, we use chopsticks. So for them, they have an innovation. Um, they create the chopsticks by using crackers. So instead of throw the chopsticks away after the meal, you can enjoy the chopsticks as a cracker. So that is kind of a business innovation that help consumers to, you know, to pick whatever they like. And sometimes for food delivery, the platform, they also incentivize the consumers. 
For example, if you choose biodegradable packaging, and then we can um, give you, for example, the environmental friendly shopping bags as a return. So those kind of like small incentives, it also help consumer to choose their, you know, whatever thing they want. So um, I would say there is a bottom up things is picking up now in China. And part of that, of course, is going to be fueled by education and the way these topics are tackled by education programs. Raymond, you, you alluded to a, a joint MSc uh, on circular economy that you were working on. Can you tell us a few things, if, even if we understand it's early days still? Uh, well, absolutely. Um, we realize, and G is but one example, uh, that there is a huge demand from Chinese students, which you could say is the young generation, supported by their families, to really work hard toward better education. And many, many are interested in topics of low carbon circular economy. So partly the Chinese universities have started to offer such courses, partly indeed the Chinese students go to UK and other universities worldwide to study those things and then to become ambassadors, to become managers, to set up their own businesses in that direction or to give advice to the government. So what we thought we should be doing rather than carrying on to attract Chinese students to our universities here, to have a real partnership with one of their top universities. And it starts um, on a smart level that indeed we have this general exchange, but since the master program there is running over two and a half years, while the master programs here are much shorter, that we could include our shorter master program into their overall study program. So on their side, the advantage would be that the students would do the traditional two and a half years of a master program in China, then with the ability to, I would say, just learn a bit more, especially on the engineering side, quantitative modeling side, environmental science, all issues where the Chinese universities are really, really strong. And then spend one year here in UCL, or indeed, I understand, Edinburgh and other universities are also active on this, uh, see Europe, uh, have the sort of spirit of the European education system with more independence of researchers, learn more actively to articulate a research question and then work with methodologies on it, and then return to China and finish the masters there. So these students, which could indeed be European students and Chinese students, would then have a dual master degree, which is acknowledged in both Europe and China. They would, on the European side, speak the language, understand the culture, be immediately able to work for a business or for an organization in China or elsewhere. And on the Chinese side, indeed, the advantage is that they would also, say, basically get two degrees for the price of one. So that's like how we would like to start it with the existing master programs. And then in a parallel step, we prepare the development of a um, a dual master that really focuses stronger on the circular economy that indeed would need to be developed and we would need to then really fix what the priorities are, what are the core skills we would like to teach, what are the core methods, how we do it, what is the expected learning outcome. So we still are pondering about uh, how we actually do it, but one of the exciting ideas is that we would also open it up early for uh, executive education so that people with a professional background could also join in a format that is indeed suitable to them. Because we realize with the Chinese speed, so many people have started to work on a circular economy and are part of the movement. And I'm sure there are many people out there who would not have the opportunity or not really think it's beneficial to spend two and a half more years at a university, but then finding certificates, uh, courses, formats that suit them would then come with a executive education angle uh, for a circular economy. I think both directions are what we have in mind and we try to do the sort of 
paperwork, the preparation in the next year, and then indeed launches and then have the first students in, say, two years from now. Uh, fingers crossed, we are not yet there. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Raymond. And uh, the report that you've been talking about, of course, people can access that on the Foundation website on the publications page. Uh, we're going to wrap this session. Uh, thank you again both for coming online, and I'm sure that we'll have more questions that we might be able to direct to you on an individual basis later on. Next show uh, in the live studio is at five with our distinguished cities team who are going to talk through a few of the cities' innovation on circular economy that they've seen uh, around the world and are still working on at the moment. And of course, don't forget to join us tomorrow for the grand finale, which is at five as well. If I'm not mistaken, Colin says fine, so it's five. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you uh, for the skinny mammoth crew in the studio as well for making this possible. Thanks a lot, Josh.